especially to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, to, today, I'd like to actually um, give a talk in topology that is entirely motivated by algebraic geometry. So, um, the general theme uh, behind this is the very original uh, point of view of Solomon Lefschetz on uh, uh, the first proof of something called the Lefschetz theorem, which was to understand the algebraic geometry of an algebraic surface by slicing it up into curves and um, constructing a, a family of Jacobian varieties of those curves and associating to a cohomology class a section of that uh, bundle. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do, because I'm not sure of, of the audience, is I'll, oh, I can use that. That's uh, one page forward, one page back. And that's a, uh, a, red, a red point of mark. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. No, that's the self destruct button. <laughs> <laughs> Eject a seat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let me, let me begin by uh, I'm sure that, that, uh, that most uh, of you have heard of, of the, the big general problem called the Hodge problem, but just let me start at the very beginning, if I can make this move. I don't know which is up and which is down. Do that? No, 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 no. Just oh, move. up. The cursor yeah. button. Yes. Ah, yeah, yes. 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 Oh, wrong button. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the idea uh, of this problem is to generalize the the, the constructions, original constructions of Lefschetz for studying algebraic cycles. So that the thing, um, the object of study here will be a, a compact complex manifold of uh, even complex dimension, in fact projective. Um, so uh, we will have a uh, very ample line bundle M, in fact, very, very ample. I won't go into how ample uh, here, but one thing uh, for sure that, um, uh, that our manifold uh, we want embedded in a, uh, the projective space uh, associated to the uh, hypersurfaces, if you will, or the sections of that of that line bundle. Uh, in doing the topology, of, uh, analogous topology, uh, we want to uh, use a metric uh, at every stage. And so the, the metric will be the standard metric on this projective space, simply restricted to whatever object comes up in, in the discussion. Uh, so, we want to understand the sub-varieties. But the new scalar product of H, the zero M is not canonical. The, so say again? The scalar product on H zero of M is, is no scalar product. So, uh, I mean, we use Fubini studi metric, right? Mm -hmm. On the projective space. Okay. That, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, but we must, we must choose a uh, basis. So, anyhow, it's a for Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, a for Vini student metric, <laughs> correct advice. Uh, by the way, can you read the slides in the back? Is it possible to read? Okay. Um, so, um, the, the, the roughest way to calculate uh, or deal with sub-varieties of M is by their topology. So 
if we have a, 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 a subvariety S in M, uh, let's say an irreducible subvariety, then that corresponds to a, uh, a, a homology uh, class in, in degree 2, uh, let's say if it's R dimensional, uh, homology class in degree 2R, and uh, we have a decomposition of the cohomology according to types, and um, for totally uh, immediate reasons, uh, if we have an R dimensional subvariety, then the cohomology classes restricted to that uh, subvariety must vanish unless their PQ types, both the P and the Q, is less than or equal to R. And very roughly speaking, Hodge's problem or conjecture is the converse of the above statement. That in rational cohomology, if you have a class uh, that's, that's rational and of the correct type, uh, then it should come from an algebraic uh, subvariety or a, a combination of algebraic subvarieties. So, um, yeah, I think that, that slide is just what I just said. <laughs> so there's a slightly different uh, way to uh, formulate this. Um, we'll call a cohomology class on W, on our ambient space that we are studying, primitive if its restriction to a smooth hyperplane section is trivial. But there's a stronger notion of strong primitivity uh, cohomology class whose restriction to any effective divisor, however singular, is uh, trivial. And um, roughly speaking, the Hodge conjecture, well, not even roughly speaking, exactly speaking, the Hodge conjecture is equivalent to the statement that there are no strongly primitive Hodge classes. That is, if you have a class, well, I should have said something. If we are in degree 2n, that our manifold has uh, dimension 2n, the, the study of, of Hodge classes is, by standard techniques, reduced to the study of middle degree <laughs> Uh, cohomology classes. So cohomology classes of the correct type and of middle degree. So that would be NN rational cohomology classes. And uh, so the conjecture then uh, has the form that any set, that if, if a class is pro strongly primitive, that is if it restricts to zero on every divisor, then it must be zero. Uh, roughly speaking, the reason that that's equivalent is that if a cohomology class restricts non-trivially on a divisor, in some sense you can proceed by induction uh, and study the cohomology class in, on a lower dimensional uh, variety. So, so um, this is the... Um, <coughs> Uh, this is the, 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 the sort of point of view uh, that, that we'll take in this talk. So, so um, as I said, this is a topology talk about the topology of this situation. And um, what we're after is forgetting about the type of a, a cohomology class uh, and simply saying if we have a primitive cohomology class, <coughs> um, how do we study its topology in the spirit of Lefschetz's original uh, 
original uh, construction. So uh, the basic um, starting point is the so-called incidence variety, the incidence relation in the two projective spaces um, for every hyperplane section uh, of our W um, that gives us a divisor. The dual projective space uh, simply parametrizes the set of all divisors. In other words, uh, we have a vibration uh, over the dual projective space, which, I, which I'll call simply P, blackboard P in what follows, uh, of a uh, slicing up of, of, our, uh, of our W. For a little bit, we will restrict this slicing up over the smooth locus uh, that is uh, over the set of hyperplanes sections that are smooth. So <coughs> the the fundamental uh, operative uh, theorem here is a classical theorem of Deligne that the Lorray spectral sequence for that. Uh, family X smooth over P smooth, uh, that Lorray spectral sequence degenerates at E2. And um, the, uh, the fact that we are going to be studying primitive cobology classes that restrict to zero on fibers says that where we should look for the um, cohomology of such a class in the Lorray spectral sequence at E2 is forms which are degree 1 in the base and degree 2n minus 1 in the fiber direction. Uh, so uh, the not the top uh, piece of the uh, Lorray filtration of the cohomology, but one down from the top. So, let's see here. So, uh, we must understand that part of the cohomology. A theory of, a theorem uh, of uh, Nori says that, in fact, <laughs> there is an isomorphism between the uh, cohomology over the base and the um, and the this piece of, of the cohomology. In what follows, we'll work with all the possible coefficients z, q, r, and c. Uh, but um, when we do homology or cohomology with integral coefficients, it will always be modulo torsion. So um, we have four local systems. We have uh, because the cohomology uh, is locally constant. If we're forgetting about the, the complex structure, uh, and uh, we have a resolution of the local systems, uh, uh, the A being C infinity forms. Uh, real valued, um, the um, omega is holomorphic forms um, since the uh, P smooth is affine, we can compute complex cohomology directly off the cohomology of the bottom sequence. So if we start with a any primitive uh, rational NN class. That'll be eta. We want to associate to it a, uh, a Durham class in the first cohomology of the base with coefficients in the 2n minus first cohomology of the fiber. 
And roughly speaking, in, in naive terms, the way that is done, if we have a one form in the base, we have to tell them what happens when we pair a tangent vector in the base with that one form. We lift the tangent vector in the projective space uh, to a C infinity section of the normal bundle of the fiber in the total space, contract against the form. Basically, that's the rule uh, for uh, association. And um, since the connection is flat, uh, we have a nabla, we have a differentiation, and uh, this omega becomes a nabla closed uh, one form with coefficients in the cohomology. Um, <coughs> so now, for reasons that I hope will become uh, clear later on, are certainly known to, to many of you who who've uh, looked at this circle of, of, uh, of ideas, um, there's going to be something called a normal function, which I uh, talked about at, at the outset. And um, that is basically going to be the integral. So when we have a flat connection, <laughs> we have a one form under a flat connection, we can integrate. So you simply integrate from any given base point um, this, uh, this one form with coefficients in, in the fiber that will give you a, a, a zero form that is not well defined, that is a section that is not well defined. But since we started with, and now I'm going to, to assume not just that my eta is was a rational class, but that it was an integral class. If it was an integral class, then the associated um, integral of omega is well-defined uh, modular <laughs> integral period. So, uh, so gives us a section uh, of the um, gives us a section of, of the so-called uh, Jacobian bundle. But for the moment, uh, I am not going to care about uh, the complex structure in, in this setting and simply take the Jacobian bundle as real cohomology of the fiber mod integral cohomology of the fiber, period. So uh, in that sense, Jacobian bundles exist for every <laughs> Uh, cohomology. Uh, in fact, uh, this point of view is taken in a series of papers by Harvey and Lawson on um, uh, differential characters. This is a differential character way of, of looking at these things. So um, the we are going to need a little bit of the um, cohomology uh, of singular fibers. We're going to need enough that the complement of the open set we're considering is of co-dimension two or higher in the projective space. The easiest way to do that is to allow simply one ordinary node for uh, as th an allowable singularity, <coughs> and then uh, the uh, that gives a Zariski open set whose, whose complement is co-dimension two, because we are going to be dealing in a minute with the Poincaré bundle, and it's uh, it's uh, first churn, first churn class, and so we need uh, we need something compact. <laughs> over which to deal with it. So then our situation is, and it's uh, quite simple, uh, although this has been done uh, in the, um, I mean, it's simple in the algebraic setting, but it's even more simple in the, in the uh, C infinity setting to extend this family of uh, 
of bundles in a, in a canonical way. <coughs> so you have tori, compact tori uh, for over the smooth points and slightly non-compact. Uh, one, one lattice generator goes to infinity at over the uh, double point locus. So, um, again, not hard at all um, that if you make um, the appropriate uh, uh, modification of the way you take your cycle in, in its cohomology class, and it's, it's not essential here, so I'm going to just skip that, but with a, with a little caveat, you can extend any C infinity normal function associated to your cycle over this, uh, this locus. Um, in fact, you can do that um, over um, any, yeah, along any subvariety of, of, of the P double point that has a dimension less than or equal to N. This, um, or if your class is strongly primitive, uh, less than or equal to dimension 2N. So, um, and I should mention that um, there's uh, work of, uh, uh, recent work over the last 10 years of um, several people, Chanel Green, Griffiths Brosnan, Perlstein, that actually construct extensions uh, of uh, the algebraic normal function over the entire projective space. You, you didn't let us see what is J tilde. Uh, J tilde, yeah, I am not able to define J tilde without uh, um, a lot of uh, so it's the it's the so you do a D module uh, construction. You do use cytone mixed Hodge modules. You take the uh, it's called the the minimal extension uh, in the sense of mixed Hodge modules inside a um, but but the the mixed Hodge module that you take. Um, the behavior at infinity, uh, yeah, there are different points of view. So, so for instance, Green, Griffiths, uh, Brosnan, and Perlstein construct one kind of extension. Uh, Schnell constructs another. Um, Schnell's actually has the advantage that the fibers of, of this J twiddle are all Hausdorff or abelian. Uh, Lee groups, um, everything is separated. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, if we go there, that's a whole other talk better given <laughs> by others. Yeah. Okay. So, um, now, um, the, the thing I want to say here is that um, the intersection pairing, on, we're dealing with 2n minus 1 middle dimensional cohomology of the hyperplane section xp. The intersection pairing there uh, gives a unimodular isomorphism between the cohomology and its dual. Again, this depends nothing on the complex structure. It's simply uh, Poincaré duality. But you can um, set it up uh, algebra, well, complex analytically. And I have that on this slide. This will not be uh, important uh, to what we're going to look at next. But uh, the, the basic idea is we have a torus, we call it J associated to X of P. There's a dual torus. There's a, there's a canonical isomorphism 
between those two tori given by the uh, given by the intersection pairing. So uh, this is with complex structure, but you can look at both of those as simply uh, real cohomology modulo integral cohomology uh, and dual period. So <laughs> this intersection pairing, if you will, distinguishes a cohomology class in H2 of the fiber product, so of the product of each torus with its uh, dual, um, simply it's the, the one associated under all the topologies to the identity map from the cohomology to itself. Um, it turns out if you're keeping track of type, this cohomology class is of type 1,1. One, one. And uh, the cohomology class is the restriction, uh, I'm sorry, is the churn class of the so-called Poincaré bundle um, on the extended uh, Jacobian and, and uh, its dual. But in the bottom, that should be a fibered product over the base. I left out the the fiber product. Um, if you make a few uh, conditions to normalize this thing horizontally as the hyperplane section moves, we'll call that the normalized Poincaré bundle. Uh, any two versions of the Poincaré bundle differ over uh, by a line bundle over the base. And uh, we're going to take it so that on the zero section, that line bundle is trivial. <laughs> so this is the normalized Poincaré bundle. And so now uh, I'm ready to talk about the first of, of uh, two uh, topological questions uh, that are very closely related in spirit uh, to uh, Lefschetz's original uh, point of view in, in the case of the study of, of surfaces. So the first question is this, and put it as, as elementary terms as possible. Suppose now we have two integral primitive cohomology classes. Then um, Using the uh, using Poincaré duality, the isomorphism from J to its dual, uh, we have a section of the um, of the fibered product of the Jacobian bundle with its dual, uh, given by those two. The first one directly by our construction. The second one uh, composing with the polarization. So the question is, if I give you those, simply the alpha eta prime, I give you those two sections, how do you compute the wedge product, or you will, the, the, uh, the intersection number of the cycles from which they call? So it's, a, it's the only possible thing that it could be, is the answer. Uh, you simply take the Poincaré bundle, restrict it to the uh, locus of, of the section over, let's say, a Lefschetz line in the base, and uh, you take a first shirt class. So that's the, uh, this was, uh, was proved um, in the uh, setting of algebraic cycles um, uh, in some work of Griffiths and Green, at least there was a sketch of the proof in some work about 10 years ago. Turns out this has nothing to do with algebraic anything. This is just topology. This is true uh, completely uh, in general. 
So, um, let's go uh, now to the next point. So, so this gives us a way, if you will, of, of, uh, of dealing with incidents between cycles um, at the level of normal functions without, in some sense, returning to the original, uh, to the original variety. So, now, the other piece of Lefschetz's um, original uh, point of view was um, the sub something called, well, which uh, you probably have all studied, Jacobi inversion. That is, uh, if you have a, a surface and you have algebraic curves on the surface, sliced up like we have done, so that the dimension would be one, um, then what you would like is that every point on the Jacobian uh, correspond to some cycle on the curve. Because if you ever get that, then normal function gives you a section of cycles on each of the slices xp of your original w, put those all together, you've constructed the algebraic cycle you were looking for. You started with a cohomology class, you took a section of the Jacobian bundle, you did Jacobian version, you got a curve given by some divisors of degree zero floating across this family of surfaces, of, uh, of, of algebraic curves. So, um, the, the last point of this talk will be that um, Jacobi inversion topologically is easy. <laughs> and um, this uh, is simply by looking a little bit into the theory of uh, differential characters and a little more surprisingly, using the metric, um, the, um, there is a topological version of something called the height pairing um, uh, between cycles. I, I'm not going to go into the height pairing in general. The definition of it will emerge uh, in, in, in what follows. Let's see, so how am I doing on time? Do I have 10 minutes more? Um, um, we'll not. I mean, okay, well, I'll, yeah, I'm not going to take more than that. You've half an hour up to now. Yeah, yeah, you've got 20 minutes anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, yes. Anyway, so, so in the classical theory, if you have an algebraic curve, you have its Jacobian torus, every point on there corresponds to a divisor of degree zero on the curve. The simplest divisor of degree zero on a curve is the difference of two points, <laughs> p minus q. So, um, mimicking that um, in, in arbitrary uh, dimension, we are now going to, so two points are co-dimension two on the surface. So we are going to take Sorry, two points are um, co-dimension. It, yeah, it depends on whether we're doing doing complex co-dimension or real co-dimension. And um, what I'm going to have to describe this in, in, is in terms of uh, real dimension and co-dimension. So we're going to take on our slice xp of, of this manifold xp. Uh, has real dimension 4n minus 2. <laughs> okay. So the middle dimension of xp is 2n minus 1. We are going to take a closed submanifold of of dimension 2n minus 2, one below the middle dimension, just like uh, so this would be 
the difference of points in the, when n was 1, the zero dimensional to manifold. Okay. So, um, and we're going to, or sum of submanifolds, but just let's just think of it at the moment as a single submanifold because um, p minus q is disconnected, but the analogous object from dimension uh, 4 on is a connected, it can be represented by a connected uh, uh, submanifold, closed submanifold of xp, real dimension 2n minus 2, and homologous to 0. So, oops. so we'll consider that submanifold as a 2n current. So current um, is form with coefficients in distributions, a slight generalization of the Rom theory. The confusing part is, um, so you consider um, uh, the sigma as a linear operator on smooth forms of degree 2n minus 2. As such, it goes in cohomology degree 2n. So just uh, complementary uh, degree. So um, currents from the time of Durham have their Hodge theory, harmonic theory, um, they have a harmonic decomposition just like ordinary uh, Durham cohomology does in the presence of a metric. And we'll, we have an A distinguished metric uh, uh, given by uh, uh, choosing metric on the uh, original projective space in which we started. Okay. So there's Green's <coughs> operator and there's the whole business. So um, we'll consider this as, as a current. Um, it is the boundary of, uh, in two different ways. Uh, those of you familiar with the height pairing on algebraic cycles will recognize this, uh, this construction. So um, it is the boundary of a current. And this is uh, this language is really taken from Harvey Lawson, Sparks, differential characters, and all of that business. So um, we all consider in, in the one case the um, uh, lifting, if you will, uh, to uh, by the Green's operator and then taking uh, d star to produce a form off of the support of sigma that has some sort of behavior um, at sigma such that, so this is, this is a current, omega is a current of degree 2n minus 1 whose co-boundary is sigma, but it's it is, uh, this is the Green's operator produces this for you, uh, it's a form, a differential form, except over the support of sigma. So um, both of those two objects, the uh, gamma and omega uh, sigma, have the same boundary. So their difference is a closed current. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, let me actually go on to the next slide, which I think uh, uh, says this better. Um, the, so the difference of these is a closed current, so it has a harmonic decomposition with only two of the, the three components. Typically, a, Harmonic decomposition is image of D star plus image of D plus harmonic. Uh, and uh, since this difference is a um, is is um, is closed, it has only two of those components. 
Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to look at this in a couple of different ways. So one way of saying that is that we've taken the current capital gamma and we've taken its harmonic decomposition. Remember that the omega sigma is in the image of D star. So this is, given the metric, we have a canonical, uh, if you will, harmonic decomposition of that which in the curve case is the path from P to Q, where P, uh, P minus Q is, is the uh, uh, divisor uh, of degree zero. Um, you'll notice that um, uh, there is a harmonic piece here, right? Um, the harmonic piece uh, considered uh, modulo integral cohomology um, is a point in the Jacobian. So, um, if you will, this is a way of sending sigma, our original submanifold, to a point in the Jacobian of the XP. Um, it's, it, of course, is not canonical as it is in the algebraic case. Uh, we had to choose a metric. We had to, uh, because, of course, the, the integral uh, against gamma is um, is not well defined on cohomology classes. You've got to make a choice. And so the, the metric gives you a choice. So we have kind of three things at play. We have uh, the uh, D, what I call D tau sigma. That piece comes from the, um, uh, the, the, the image of D part. We have the, the image of D star part. And uh, we have the point in the intermediate Jacobian. So they'll all kind of come into play here in, in the last part as we're uh, in, in a way that um, I'll try to say quickly. So, so now, um, So if you will, if we have a family of uh, homologically trivial sigmas. So that's uh, another omega sigma prime. Uh, that is omega sigma. And the other one is, o is epsilon sigma prime. Well, what is epsilon? Yeah, OK. Hang on. <laughs> OK. I wanted to, um, um, so far we have given a, a um, sub-manifold of uh, dimension, real dimension, 2n minus 2, we've associated a point in the Jacobian. It's this very simple exercise that there are lots of such sub-manifolds. In fact, you can make them out of uh, algebraic vanishing cycles, actually 2n minus 2 spheres that vanish at some point uh, where you have a node, that gives you a, 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 a yeah, almost too big a, a class for Jacobian version. That is, the mapping from all such sigma onto the uh, Jacobian is certainly uh, surjective. So that's a kind of topological Jacobian version, if you will. So the last piece is, suppose I have two of th such things. Um, the way that this occurs is, um, say I have an algebraic threefold, and I have uh, two submanifolds below the middle dimension. That's two algebraic curves. Um, and let's suppose either those two algebraic curves are, yeah, let's suppose they're homologous. Um, then if they don't intersect, there's something called a height pairing, which you can construct. And um, the last piece of this is to say, again, that height pairing is topological. <laughs> it's, so let me, uh, let me go to uh, 
go to that last piece. So now our setting in this last part is we have two submanifolds, sigma and sigma prime. Um, they need not be disjoint. Um, but uh, for a part of you might as well consider them as disjoint, uh, although it's important that you can actually do this when, when they are not disjoint. So, um, but let's consider them as disjoint to describe simply what's going on. So um, we have the, again, the harmonic forms, Inside of there, uh, we have integral period representatives, those I'm calling a basis of those I'm calling uh, gamma sub j. Um, and now, we take that real module, harmonic forms extended on one side by the omega um, corresponding to the uh, the first sigma on the other side by the uh, fundamental class of the sigma prime <laughs> simply I mean you can put this all in some relative cohomology group of some open thing but uh, the simplest way um, is that and we'll put an integral structure on that real vector space uh, by um, writing down, um, in some sense, what the integral cohomology would be if uh, you took the cohomology of xp minus sigma relative sigma prime. So th it, that has an integral structure. We just copy that integral structure in here. That's the integral structure. And the formulas there say how that is, how that is made uh, in terms of uh, the harmonic decomposition. So the, this last little piece, the <coughs> lowest degree coefficient of the highest degree integral element that essentially is the height pair. So, um, so all of this you you do with uh, no. Um, but C was harmonic. Say again. C was harmonic. Um, so because you take the D of C sigma prime. So if C, maybe I remember, C was harmonic. D or of psi. psi. Psi, I think Psi was the harmonic part. Psi was the uh, that the harmonic part. That's so right. If you take D of Psi, then it's zero. Wait, if I got, hang on. So omega. Um, they base D of something else, not of Psi. Yeah. Um, it was the, the the other the other chap. So it's uh, omega. There was omega Psi and uh, well. That that is tau. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that sorry, I changed the notation okay. after I gave this talk the first time. That is tau. tau. But psi is tau. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so um, so there we are. And um, now another way of saying this, and all, all this is doing is taking a theorem of. Dick Hain from 15 years ago and de-algebra algebra sizing it. Yeah. <laughs> the set of all equivalence classes of integral structures uh, suitably de uh, defined on R is the, the fiber of the Poincaré bundle, <laughs> considered as a circle bundle. <laughs> and this, um, this choice of sigma and sigma prime gives a lifting, if you will, of the point alpha alpha prime in J P cross J P dual into the Poincaré bundle. So it's giving a section, if you will, uh, and we know that those sections have to break up somewhere 
because you, if you've got a global section of the Poincaré bundle, uh, the course of the first churn class would be zero, the two cycles wouldn't intersect. So, um, yeah, I think I will stop there. Thank you all very much for your attention.